super excited to 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 talk um, and to present, and most importantly, to take you on a little bit of a journey um, on on all the projects that we we work on and 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 the sort of ecosystem that we have uh, here in London, um, which is very much um, oriented towards um, environmental design, but closely linked with technology. Um, so hence the term eco parametric architects like to invent fancy words, but really it's just there is parametric design, but I, I really believe that technology is really a bit useless unless it, it helps the planet, uh, hence the, the, the ecology added to it. Um, so uh, let me, let me take you on a, on a little, uh, uh, detour through the desert, uh, because really the, the process of, of learning how to do environmental design is complex involves many parameters and is really much a journey. And that project was uh, a, a big learning curve for us. Uh, one, we had to uh, um, fund it ourselves. <laughs> we had to uh, build it with volunteers. Uh, we had to uh, actually assemble it in 18 days with about uh, 180 people um, far away in, in the desert of Nevada in the USA. So um, I will show you that, but um, really this was full of uh, of uh, errors, of uh, miscalculations, of uh, and I, I'm here not to show you, um, you know, the finished things, the fancy things. But I, I'm here to show you all our mistakes and uh, and how important it is to to accept that nothing is really perfect and that um, the journey is full of uh, uh, of discoveries and and that's the pleasure and that's why I love uh, you know showing this journey. Um, so we have two companies, and it's important because one is a design studio, um, Mamumani, which obviously is, is the yin to the other yang, which is the, the FabPub. FabPub stands for Fabrication Public, um, and it's open to everyone, and everyone can design and, and make and be empowered by the machines that we have. Um, I really wanted them to be two separate companies because I, I really believe that um, if we don't empower others, um, then all that happens is you put artists on a pedestal and, and people don't feel like they can have a share in the, 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 um, in the responsibility of, 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 of designing new things and they become passive consumerist people. So I really want to break that and I think digital fabrication can help doing that. Um, so that's our studio in Hackney. Um, before we moved, we just moved to a, a slightly larger hangar, but we're full of like objects that we make. And so it's very much, um, let's say, less about computers and more about um, uh, regaining the means of production of uh, what reconnects us with the final objects. And so FabPub, for example, um, the, the ambition, and I talk about it because I think it'll probably outgrow Mamumani very soon. Uh, luckily, after uh, 10 years of Mamumani, uh, yesterday was the anniversary of, of our company, but this one is slightly younger, but it's um, what's been nice, it's grown with the community that comes and book our machines. Um, and also, for example, during the pandemic, we, we produce masks for the NHS with the bioplastics. Um, and that was a brilliant way to show why mini factories, urban mini factories, distributed manufacturing is so important. Um, simply because, I don't know if it's the same in Greece, but when came COVID, we didn't have enough protective equipment. So we had to sort of outsource to China, which is kind of crazy because the whole world was uh, blocked anyways. And so the ability to produce locally um, and to uh, actually uh, be a source of uh, things for the for the world around directly around us without having to travel crazy distance, be stuck in the Suez Canal, and all these things, is extremely important. Um, so I'm really lucky to have a, an incredible team, um, uh, extremely uh, diverse in their in their background, but also in their skills, and and everyone is sort of. Um, a little bit outside of the normal boundaries of what you'd expect as an architect or a fabricator. Um, I really do not like specialism. I, I think like uh, being a generalist um, helps you to think holistically. Uh, so this was with Arup, the, the, the engineering firm that gave us a grant to develop a, a new kind of robot that's called cable robotics. And I, the reason I show you that is not just because it, it's, a, it's a kind of interesting uh, robot, uh, but it's also because you see the tower on the right was an idea of assembling a tower that could also disassemble itself. And the reason I, I you know, in nature, uh, when, when a plant doesn't have enough sun or uh, when, when it doesn't have enough water, it, it sort of, it, it dies, right? And uh, it's in, it then sort of sends seeds around and reproduces itself and it's all good, it's all good. Um, we don't see, if, you know, in nature, in plants, we don't kind of 
um, see that as a as a as a sort of very sad thing. It's just what what nature does. But when we build in architecture and and we build something that at you know like a giant tower in Dubai and then it ends up empty, somehow there's no way to adapt to the economy. There's no way to sort of unbuild, ungrow, um, and that's a strange thing, right? Um, because uh, we don't know what the economy is going to do, and we, we we have to have the ability to to adapt to it. And yet, architecture is sort of stuck in the. Maybe it's the ego of architect. You know, they see the the, the Parthenon in Greece, and they <laughs> they all want to have the most beautiful ruins. Um, but um, it's a shame because if we thought of our buildings as, as things that couldn't build themselves, um, then we'd have the ability to think beyond us, beyond. Um, migration beyond, you know, um, things that we know now are very common. I, I you know, I didn't work on the Eiffel Tower, <laughs> but it's definitely my my favorite building. Um, and what I find really stunning about it is, it's just that it was built to be disassembled. Um, it wasn't meant to be permanent, and it was part of a fair that was you know, showcasing technology. And it was just to excite people about what's possible, yet it was just going to be taken down and it stayed. And and I think this this notion of temporary versus permanent is very much something that I've learned at, at Burning Man. Uh, Burning Man is is a sort of a event, a city that, that happens for a week in the desert. And then uh, it sort of starts from nothing and then goes back to nothing at the end. Um, and these are some of the projects we built with the students um, at University of Westminster. And I very much learned how to uh, uh, use off-the-shelf um, uh, timber and, and other materials that we can disassemble um, very, very quick and, and, and that can interact with people and can have a certain meaning um, and, and have a sense of playfulness to them. I think uh, architecture, we, we're so disconnected with, with, with our urban environment, with architecture. We just see it as this sort of concrete, cold, soulless, you know, most of the time, to be honest. I, I don't know if it's the same in Greece, but, uh, you know, in, in, in um, the kind of modern architecture in, in France, my, my, my dad grew up in a, in a suburb of Paris, which was a horrible modernist, uh, uh, you know, uh, city. And, and we just... Um, I think, I don't know, when, when I studied architecture, I realized that people <laughs> don't like architects, <laughs> don't like contemporary architecture. And, uh, and that source of disconnection, I think, is very much because um, we lost track of trying to explain what it is that we do and provide things that are connected to the soul, not just to function. Um, and this, you know, when you see nature, when you go to a park, when you walk around and you see uh, beautiful flowers, beautiful things, there is, you don't need to explain flowers and you don't, <laughs> your people just love them. And, and how do we get inspired by, by nature, not just the, in terms of um, the mechanism of nature, but, but also um, how do we have this directness of interaction? So these are some of the projects we did with the eco, eco parametric workshop, um, which was a you know a sort of six week long workshop, and 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 the students created uh, objects that were inspired by nature. But in many ways, I'll explain how how the process through that. So we end up making a lot of our projects because we have Maomani and FabPub, so we can actually fabricate uh, things that are uh, done locally and can be installed locally and can be tested. Um, and most importantly, we get to experience with material very, very um, closely with the type of materials we use. Um, so we try and design systems rather than finished forms. And that, that's a really important concept. So this is a timber uh, office building that we were meant to do in, in, in Paris, in the suburbs of Paris. And it's basically the typical module of an office uh, that is then tested against different program um, different constraints of structure, of environment, of, um, you know, uh, requirements by the brief. Um, and so by having this, the clients, it wasn't about like a finished form, but he could play around with that module. The reason that, uh, you know, we started switching completely with wood is, as you probably know, concrete is responsible for about 8% of low carbon emission in the world. It's the second most used substance after water, concrete. Or I could give you more stats like this. In the past year, concrete has used more, uh, uh, um, China has used more concrete than uh, the entire US for like 100 years, for example. Like, I don't know, it's just staggering what's going on. And, and when you think about that, um, wood, timber is, is the ultimate environmental material. It's literally absorbed carbon. Um, and so, 
you know, be able to work with wood is, is so interesting, but it also comes with constraint. For example, this is a hotel we're doing in, in Bacalar in Mexico. And if you were to unfold each one of these lines, you'd have straight lines. And, uh, and that's really important because um, you don't want to waste. It's not because you're using an environmental material that you'd like to waste it. Things like plywood, chipboard, MDF, you know, are basically re-engineered wood. Uh, but when you actually get the wood in its purest form, it's like, a, you know, it's relatively good. But how do you deal with it? You know, how do you create three-dimensional shape from it so that you don't have to use like, you know, very cheap forms and, and, and CNC them and, and so on and so forth. And so learning how to use timber in its raw form also means you can use reclaimed timber. So for example, here for a tower we're doing in Bali, we have, uh, the client has bought a, a bridge, literally an old bridge that wasn't used. And, and, and timber is actually uh, really, really uh, long lasting. I don't know, I'm sure you know that the, the, we have the Tudor home here in, in, in the UK. It also teaches you about uh, sustainable forestry, um, how to make sure that, that we have enough wood. It goes hand in hand with a holistic thought process. Um, and I mean, obviously there's no timber everywhere. And so here is, for example, we used as sand. So we printed in sand um, and, and another resin um, uh, with, with uh, Chris Brecht, which was a really wonderful uh, experience, uh, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and talking about sustainable forestry, you know, a lot of the problems in forests is that um, you need to build roads to access them. Access is a big, so we're, we're developing, um, 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 sorry, hydrogen, uh, oh, sorry, helium-based, uh, not hydrogen, <laughs> those are bad, but helium-based uh, aircrafts um, uh, with a company called Flying Wells in, in France and developing uh, ways to to access remote uh, forests without destroying actually most of it um, and so this will be like um, a project of hangars for uh, flying uh, helium balloons um, which obviously is also better than helicopters and, and planes um, and uh, just to finish on this general intro um, 3d printing opened up uh, a whole kind of world for us because uh, we write software for it and so things like food uh, is also somehow printable but not, probably not the best application because uh, you end up with some of weird foods but it's funny how being an architect and being involved with robotics and so on meant that we we sort of expanded what's the usual scope of works of an architect that's what I meant by having a team that's open-minded because, you know, we are always out of our scope, but, you know, it's because we are redefining a certain scope. And, and so being, being um, curious and, and open and generalist help us sort of uh, think in that holistic fashion. So this is my diploma project uh, at the Architectural Association in London, 2008. And the idea was to link uh, a component with the sun um, and being able to show the, the, the array of possibilities from that component. Um, on a, this was a building by Oscar Niemeyer, which I loved and I was trying to pay homage uh, by, by actually showing the potential of it. Um, and, and so I, I graduated uh, um, and I joined an office and I was given the task to work on a, on a, on a biodome that would reproduce, mimic the ecosystem of, uh, um, of Congo in, uh, in Chester, in north of England. Quite a challenge, uh, but it's one of those really amazing projects where you get to think as a whole holistically because we had to think of the plants, of the, um, of the type of ecosystem of flora and fauna. Uh, that could be to develop inside these, um, and you know, I don't know if you know about Biosphere Two and all these initiatives, uh, the Eden Project, um, initiatives to, um, to 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 create greenhouses that are actually um, helping grow plants that wouldn't otherwise grow, um, and so it all starts with a roof. Um, and this is called a geodesic um, curve. Uh, it's the shortest path between two points on a surface. Um, I won't geek up too much. Uh, but the beauty is that the component that, that, that is applied, this sort of triangular equilateral component, gets denser where it's needed to be denser. And so you, you get a, a structure that is very much the result of the forces going through that, that structure. And so I think that's really interesting because uh, when I talked about algorithms being linked with uh, the natural environment or ecoparametric architecture, this is really a sort of um, exercise in, in, in that, in, in, in having something that... Um, uses technology towards having thinner beams or using less material, minimizing the use of material and so on and so forth. 
Um, these are simulations. So I graduated. It was the crisis, uh, you know, uh, 2008 crisis, big crisis in, in, in the world and in the UK. Didn't have any, uh, you know, any opportunity at all and started my own practice. Um, very much because also these parametric tools weren't really used um, in terms of fabrication and so on. Like no office really had a giant printer in their office as you, as you do. Um, and so I was lucky to be paired with uh, shop window uh, retailers and become, I started doing like experiential marketing, stuff like that. Um, and these are simulation using a physics engine to try and uh, reproduce what we call origamis. And this idea of joining like sort of um, traditional technique with technology was really nice because you can get three-dimensional out of planes, um, which is really efficient in terms of use of material. And when we do this, when we work parametrically, we work as systems. So therefore, we develop uh, families of possibility rather than finished things. And I think that's really important to, to start thinking iteratively. So talking about nature and how nature creates mutations and each mutation is tested against, uh, you know, uh, against fitness criteria. Um, nature doesn't really, uh, I mean, it depends on your belief, but if you believe in evolution, um, <laughs> which I, I hope you do, um, you basically, there are small mutation over billions of years um, and then each mutation is tested and nature doesn't think, oh, I should do that mutation. It just kind of does it. And in a way, if you design this way, you lose, you let go of preconceived ideas of, of the top down idea of a genius that comes up with a form. Um, and you actually just kind of slowly make your way towards um, what you're going to propose to the client, whatever is going to get built, uh, you slowly make your way towards that, thinking of all the different um, possibilities and, and, and the reasons why you do things. And I really enjoy this. It's very th therapeutic. We, we hardly debate in the studio. We just do. And often the solution is sort of democratically um, preferred, um, which I really love as a process. Um, and so this is, for example, the wooden waves. It's a, it's a plywood sheet that is being laser cut to form a three-dimensional uh, wave. And then all these modules are then um, kind of repeated to dense around things like AC units and so on, uh, which gives us great freedom to, um, um, to sort of uh, use, um, you know, uh, this sort of cladding um, structure that, that actually provides acoustic uh, insulation and so on, but in a, in a, in a way that is a little bit more... Um, uh, inspiring for people uh, than the usual office uh, <laughs> suspended ceiling. This is for the uh, Orange Telecommunication Headquarters. As we used a similar technique for, for the entire wall. Um, this, is, this is like an origami uh, type of structure, giant uh, origami that, that uses very, very thin Zintec, uh, which is a, a material that, that, that doesn't ox oxidate. So th these are um, some of the sort of structures that I showed you that would unfold with straight lines and are steam bent, uh, which also bring a little bit of this natural um, approach uh, to design within the, the corporate environment, which I, I think will be more and more necessary and also proven to be much better for your mental health. Um, so switching to a little bit to 3D printing, which I think is a very important uh, technology for our days. Uh, this is called G-Code. Uh, it's what you send to a printer when you want a printer to, to, to do something, not just a printer, but a CNC machine, any kind of digital fabrication. Um, it has simple, simple instruction. Uh, F for speed, X, Y, Z is where you go, E for extrusion. Uh, and basically you send this information and then the printer sort of does its thing based on what you send, which is a list of movements and actions. Uh, so it's really nice to be able to speak directly to the printer so that you can um, basically control the parameters as you print and therefore develop your own language uh, from these uh, and, and really control the amount of materials and so on, um, which often you know, third-party software used don't really tell you very precisely. Um, when we 3D print, and I, I'm sure you have little 3D printers, or some of you must have one, uh, we use PLA, polylactic acid. Polylactic acid is, uh, you know, is basically a, a bioplastic made of uh, fermented sugar or starch, you know, uh, sugar canes, beetroot, uh, uh, it could be all kinds of, um, and even potatoes or any kind of uh, starchy or su sugary uh, vegetable or foods. Um, and, and, and basically, this is a, a life cycle assessment that compares uh, PLA and, uh, and ABS. ABS is, the, you know, is what's used in 
I don't know, the Lego, for example. It's a very common uh, plastic like PET or PETG. And so you see that uh, when you compare two materials, um, there is like benefits and, 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 and pros and cons. Um, so it's, no, it's not really like, is it better? It's more like, where is it better? And where can we improve, right? And I think that's really important. Like, for example, um, you know, if you if you're uh, if you're like closer to the outside, it's better. If it's uh, closer to the inside, it's worse. So, for example, in terms of CO two emotion, is much better in terms of uh, being um, uh, being a, a car, a non carcinogenous. It's much better. You know, uh, but in terms of land use, it's not great because you obviously have to use uh, fields that were for food. And so, but but in a way, that's that's we can sort that out, right? With vertical gardens, with with uh, vertical farming and stuff like that. And so, you know, this idea of thinking holistically, I think, is really important. When I show this to clients, some of them are like, "Oh, we'll build a vertical farm. Uh, we'll grow our own plastic, right?" And after, what happens to it? It composts. So it's really good. We talked about compost just before. Um, this, the speaker just before talked about the composting. You can compost this pl plastic. It doesn't end up in the... Most plastic, uh, to be honest, is not recycled. It ends up being burnt or in the landfill, in the oceans, and become microplastics. Um, and so imagine this, if, 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 if all plastics were actually being grown in cities, composted in cities, uh, and then grow again and in a cradle-to-cradle -cradle fashion. Um, imagine if everyone had 3D printers in their home. Imagine if you didn't go to Ikea, but you would print your furnitures. Once you're done, you either um, uh, recycle them in a crusher or you compost them and, and then you grow them again, um, you know, or you, you grow food out of it, or you, you, you print another design that is more efficient that you would download from some, from some kind of like, I don't know, uh, Facebook of designs or <laughs> stuff like that. I mean, the future could be really interesting if we kind of think like that uh, in a way. Uh, so these are some of the applications that we printed. Uh, we're printing a chandelier uh, in Scotland, for example, using a PLA mixed with uh, metals, uh, which is a possibility because you can use all kinds of additives. And when we print things, we usually don't send the object, we send the printer to the site. Um, and so that's really kind of great because, uh, well, G-code code doesn't have boundaries, doesn't have Brexit. <laughs> you don't pay VAT on code, um, you know, whereas you pay VAT on objects. But I mean, in this world that we're all like, you know, the highway of information, like it's, 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 it goes at the speed of light. Like, why would we send objects if we could send the code behind objects, you know? And that, it's kind of strange to use transportation and these very, very, uh, I don't know, air freight, like uh, even like sea freight, like all these methods of transportation should really be focused on, on raw materials. And then, I mean, even that, like we could learn to work with the local raw materials and link our technology with that. Uh, but we have to rethink a little bit this um, this notion of transporting air, because when you transport object, you mostly transport air. Um, so these are some of the patterns that one can do with uh, with three D printing, and this is, for example, a typical sequence uh, that we have. We are working on at Fortnum and Mason at the, at the moment, a shop in London, um, and then we're working on on about I think there's eighty eight of these modules uh, that are um, flying across the. Uh, the atrium and and really the we try to think in terms of circular economy so repurpose reuse recycle reduce um, and the general idea is that when we work on a project we try and think of the afterlife so here we will uh, set an auction for these pieces which are actually using very little amount of bioplastic but they're really nice and so we thought people would want to buy them and then all the proceeds will go to uh, pollinators uh, charity so that we're going to help Fortnum and Mason develop more beehives, um, which um, you know is it, something that they have actually suggested, and so we're really happy. And this is for the Design Museum um, in London. You'll see it in uh, October uh, this year as part of an exhibition on waste. Um, and we'll bring our uh, crusher. So we have a we have a printer, we have a crusher, uh, and we tend to actually have no waste here, uh, which is a, a way to. Uh, so this is our whole ecosystem here. Um, which actually more and more uh, brands uh, are buying into. They won that. Uh, this was for Louis Vuitton, for example, using their famous monogram. Um, and we were trying to do a three-dimensional version of that. Um, and then not just like big brands and stuff. This is my home in London trying to, to actually make it happen. This is a visual. Uh, you know, it's not that easy. But what, we, what I realized is I wanted to use only environmental materials for this home and realized that most product that we use in our homes 
are full of plastic, full of epoxy of like, you name it, like Corian is plastic, quartz is plastic. It's like, it's crazy when you start looking into what, you know, plasterboards are bad, paint is toxic. Uh, I mean, it, it's mad. It's really mad. And it's so expensive if you want to go for reclaimed timber, if you want to. So this, this is like my realization that we really need to push for environmental products at home, not just for big buildings and so on. So, for example, we started developing these uh, partition system, uh, which is made from bioplastics and wood. Um, and so uh, it's quite nice because... Like once you have them, you have the machines, you can actually like um, customize it to the people and you can actually give it a, a certain modularity, uh, which modularity is, is a crucial part of the, pro of the projects that we work on. And um, modularity is important because it, it, can, it can be flexible. For example, this is for COS, the fashion brand, and it was in Milan for the Milan Design Week. Uh, and we had about um, uh, 700 of these bio, we call them bio bricks because they use very, very little amount of material. Uh, I mean, they use bioplastic, but that's not enough. We also want to show how to reduce, not just uh, use eco material or cradle to cradle material. So um, this was a, a geometry based on the size of our printer and also the, the, the palazzo. This was a palazzo and we wanted to show a, a way to fill it up with, uh, with these kind of eco bricks. Um, and on the right, we have the modules of the sand waves that we did in Riyadh, also a modular approach to design. Um, so you see, uh, we always try and think in that way that if there is a module, you can test a module, you can um, array the module in a way that is playful. And so people can, you know, if you design in a playful manner, people will want to play. Um, and and I, I think this playfulness also reconnects people to, 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 to their build environment because they can relate this to when they were building things when they were kids, you know, these, these games of, of, of little pieces. And, and I, I think encouraging people to build um, will, will also help us have less passive people. Like, and I think that's really important. This idea of passivity, and um, that's the kind of final role of my uh, presentation. I hope you're still with me. I, I'm not seeing you, so I hope it's all good. Um, you have, um, this is Burning Man. So Burning Man is a very important place for, uh, well, for me, but also for a big community of 70,000 people. Um, it, these are the 10 principles, radical inclusion, gifting, radical self-expression, radical self-reliance. Um, and, and a lot of companies actually send their staff there um, to, to learn about these concepts. This is the, the founder, the creator of, of Burning Man, which he says, I elevated pa passions into duty. Um, and so a very uh, engaged community. I mean, we see it as a, obviously a place where you party and, uh, and so on and so forth, but it, it's really beyond that. Um, instead of doing a, uh, art uh, um, about the state of a society, we do art that creates society around it, said Larry Harvey. The, the reason for this geometry is, is that it's, it, this community is around art, but not as a spectator. Every attendee has to bring something. There's no uh, lineup for DJs. There's no uh, performance and so on. Everyone has to kind of bring something to the table. And so uh, what's really amazing is everyone builds like uh, when you're when you arrive, there's nothing, and everyone starts building it. I don't know if you saw the the, the documentary of the 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 fire festival, the the the, the nightmare that that they the, you know this uh, documentary on Netflix. But this is the perfect opposite. Rather than come and have your ticket and and buy and then be there, the idea is that everyone takes part of it, and so we all build it together. And and there's a sense of communal effort that's really beautiful. So this is tangential dreams where people would write things, and it was all made up of the shelf timber cut with a circular saw and assembled as a sort of giant uh, algorithmic puzzle and people could write things on it. Writing things, taking part, uh, you know, in, in cities, street art, I mean, we have a strong street art community here in London, uh, but in most cities, it's, see, it's seen as vandalism, whereas it actually is a really great way to actually connect with fellow human beings. And this is the temple. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the Temple of Burning Man. You see, this, is a, this, this structure here is, is phenomenal by Greg Fleischmann. It's a giant CNC cut uh, structure without any fasteners, no connections. And that was like in 2013 when, in parallel, I was working on uh, a hotel for astronauts in, for Virgin Galactic. You know, Virgin Galactic is sending uh, people in space, and they wanted a hotel for people before they go to the, the, the space travels. And this is, this is called recursion. This is based on uh, sending vectors in space and then recreating um, a movement from this vector. So it's like a kind of recursive loop. 
And the reason I, I worked on this because, well, one, it, it looks like galaxies, but, but also because then as it grows, the system could actually adapt to the sun and the environment. And the general idea behind this was to let the, the sunlight go through when it's cold and then diffuse the sunlight when it's hot. Also using things like, um, you know, uh, we call it thermal mass um, and venturi effects to bring the cold air and avoid having air conditioning. I mean, you know, air conditioning is 10 times worse than, um, uh, than the gas, the potent, than the, the CO2. So, so it's really important to think this way. But also, I, I just, uh, you know, this was in the desert and uh, it had this sort of inverted dome geometry. And whenever you think of spiritual spaces, um, they, they somehow connect you to the sky or to the, 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 what's above, right? But often in the past, it was about showing a sense of ownership of that, of that space, right? Like a kind of dome geometry that encapsulates, reassures you in that sense. But now that we know that, and I'll, I'll take you far, far apart, but that there are black holes, there are uh, sort of uh, uh, an infinity. We don't even know the actual size of the universe. And there's something extremely humbling about it. Um, we know that there are different um, interconnections between space and time, and that if you have a point of gravity, then time has a tendency to dilute and expand, uh, contract and expand. So Galaxia was really a temple to show um, you know, a spirituality linked to the science that we currently know. Um, and, and so therefore, um, I try to kind of create a, um, a sort of new kind of temple that can actually reconnect us with our current understanding of, of space. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is a sort of a, a geometry that, that has a, a central uh, quote unquote black hole and that skews space around it so that it bends um, sort of metaphorically space, space and time, but also those modules. The modules are slowly skewing to the sky as if they were attracted from above. Um, and so it starts as a sort of gateway for people and then ends as a, as a more spiritual gateway. Um, and it's, it's using, uh, you know, not that much timber because it's all in tension. And, and we try to maximize tension in the system by orienting the cross bracing in the right direction. We used off the shelf timber. I mean, it's all self funded. So we had to like uh, fundraise a lot uh, to achieve that. Um, and then you can see that we had to actually build this with the community in a, in a really amazing way. We had about 600 applications for people coming to build this with us, which was a really, a really fantastic thing because the involvement of people um, coming to build something that they really believed in as part of a sort of giant village of, uh, um, of builders, kind of in a way reminds us of the, when, you know, when we were building the, the cathedrals a while ago, there was this empirical loop between the, the thing that you build, uh, the collapsing of things and the rebuilding. Um, and so these are some of these sort of IKEA manual that we were showing to, the, uh, to people. Um, and these are some of the forces we had to deal with. So all those Newtons are the forces going through the structure. And we were trying to use the exact amount of screws needed uh, for the forces. Also using the exact amount of wood based on off-the-shelf timber, four by four inch, uh, two by four inch. Um, and so every single piece had a role in that system. And, uh, and, and, and the team felt the same way. There wasn't a hierarchy in the structure, nor was there a, a hierarchy in the team, which I, I thought was a really, really wonderful thing, actually. Um, and, um, and then it was used by people and uh, it was um, given, giving the ability to people that are not uh, religious to mourn a lost one or in my case, get married to my wife, um, which was a, a really uh, uh, wonderful, like uh, amazing way to use that structure. Um, and, and remember when I said that we were disconnected with our structures, I think this was an ultimate sponge, something to actually get people involved, but also show them how fragile everything is. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I do not uh, recommend burning structures for sure. Um, but, uh, this is a ritual at Burning Man at, um, the, temp the, the man is burned on a Saturday and the temple is burned on a Sunday. Um, extremely organized. You can imagine, uh, fr from the Americans, like this is a very safe thing, but, um, it's 70,000 people, uh, in silence, uh, looking at, uh, at, at, at all the things they put in that structure, go away, reminding them of, the fragility and, and, and having this ability of letting go. And then we clean everything, recycle all the steel. Um, but whilst we were building it, and I'll, I'll finish on that, um, we, we thought, okay, how do, how do we take that, that ritual or how do we take all the things that I've explained and, and try and do it without burning? And so this was going to be our next structure. We were going to create this uh, catharsis structure and it's all modular, but was going to be disassembled 
and reassemble elsewhere. And the disassembly process would be part of that ritual instead of burning the structure. And so we were going to bring it to the Somerset House in London. Obviously, COVID happened. And so we had to actually uh, put it in VR, which I think is a, a fantastic thing also about um, uh, the confinement is that we had to find other spaces that are not physical. Um, and so we put it in a game engine, uh, a metaverse called Allspace. I don't know if you have Oculus uh, goggles, but we were able to actually have an event uh, but, uh, but virtually, um, obviously not as close to good as what we, we did in, uh, uh, what you do in real life, but, uh, you know, it sort of requestioned the notion of space. Like, do we really need to travel? Do, can we actually meet in that virtual space? Um, and so that will be a real challenge in the future, this idea of metaverses and, and, um, but until then, you know, if you, if you want to work, uh, on, on some of these, and if you want to join the journey, uh, I'll leave it there. <laughs> And I hope there's some of that that you can take away. Um, thank you very much. I think it's been 40 minutes exactly, I hope. Or